start at the beginning. The talk is called Future of Work. Now, as you notice, there's two main words, work and future. So a lot of this is going to be about studying and understanding the future with the examples and other things uh, in regard to this talk focused more on work than other things. Now, um, before I get too far, I want to show you, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is, if you don't recognize it, this is a map of the United States, what we call the lower 48. And I just, I'm not all of you are familiar with St. Louis because it's a medium to smaller size city. And this is where it is located. We're actually right on the Mississippi River, which you probably heard of if you had to read things like Huckleberry Finn uh, when you were a kid. This is a picture of our business building in the back. This is the best looking of the pictures. We're actually in downtown St. Louis. And um, uh, St. Louis has a reputation as a tough city uh, with a lot of crime. But if you're careful, it's also a very beautiful city. And it has many great art museums and what we call zoos. We have a botanical garden. We have ancient Native American uh, monuments all over. And we're very famous for what was called uh, the Underground Railroad. When slaves were freed in the South, they were not necessarily free to just walk around. I mean, when they were taken away from their so-called owners, they had a transportation system to take them to the North where they could be legally free. St. Louis was the main transfer place. We now have a museum that honors that whole process of uh, rendering people who should have been free anyway to being able to experience at least some level of freedom. So that's St. Louis. Now, this fellow in, this is what's called a baseball card. I don't know if it goes all the way to the southern part of South America, but I know the northern part in Central America and the Caribbean are also very interested, like in the U.S., with baseball. This is a very famous man who is as famous for his strange sayings as he is for uh, playing baseball. And he's from St. Louis, which is why I choose to show this. And one of his most famous sayings is, the future ain't what it used to be, which is worth thinking about. He also said about a famous restaurant, we never go there anymore because it's too crowded. Oh, sorry, nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. So, uh, and that's another one that takes a little bit of thought. The point of studying the future, in my opinion, is that the more we think about what the future could be, the more we change from simply being at the mercy of whatever happens to taking actions and decisions that aim to bring about the sort of future that we would like to live in. And that's the point of studying the future, in my opinion, as, as I see it. Now, some things we can't change, but if we anticipate them or we anticipate worse things than what happens, a lot of times we can enjoy and ride with them rather than be perplexed by them or, or confused or troubled. So I've been interested personally in studying the future since I was an undergraduate 60 years ago, not, not quite, 55 years ago in California. And there was a book at that time by a man named Alvin Toffler. Actually, it's co-written with his wife, so I should say by a married couple. And some say that she was the brains behind it, which would be normal, uh, since I know being married that um, um, that I know where the brains and brawn and talent lie in our family, but we'll let that go for a bit. I, I do my best, okay, we'll just leave it at that. So this was a great book because even that long ago, it observed that progress cannot be described as a linear growth, but the rate of change itself is growing. So that as we go into the future, we have to anticipate not just twice as much of whatever we encountered over the last 10 years, but an exponential amount. I'll talk more about that when we talk about Moore's Law in, in a few minutes. So I see uh, two major issues in terms of the future of work. One is, what is the nature of work itself and how will it change? Now, I recently read a great book that talks about the difference between tasks and jobs. And a lot of the forecasting about jobs like they'll say 50% of truck drivers will disappear or, or the truck driving jobs will disappear in the next 10 years. And that may or may not be true. But what this book argues is that the right level of analysis with replacing human beings is not jobs, especially for white collar 
and, and more analytical jobs, but tasks. So you take a doctor. A doctor's job is not likely to disappear, in certainly not in my lifetime, and looking around, probably not in yours, because you look like you're mostly between 20 and 50 years old. And I'm not going to say who looks 20 and who looks 50. We'll let you figure that out. But the idea is that parts of a doctor's job that are now done by the doctor will be done by computers. Now, in the last 10 years, my personal doctor has gone from pending, spending half an hour poking me and, and pulling my hair and checking my reflexes and talking stories to the doctor sitting at the computer and saying, you take this medicine, right? And you do that, right? Now, how is that going? You see what I'm saying? The doctor's job has changed in my life in the last 10 years from interacting with me physically to checking the collected data that gets better and better over time and using that and interpreting that to make diagnoses and prescriptions. Now, at some point with the right data analytics and with all the sensors, I now have a sensor that I put in every two weeks that measures my blood sugar constantly because I have uh, what's called type 2 diabetes. Okay, I hope I'm not saying too much and grossing anybody out. But that data, over time, analyzed with hundreds or thousands of other peoples and taking into account all of my other various characteristics can be compared to the diagnosis of the human doctor and eventually can be an input to the doctor's process Eventually, the doctor can be a double check on it to look for anomalies. And eventually, it will be so much more accurate than any doctor's diagnosis that it will replace it. I believe that's a progression that has been seen in many tasks and jobs. And I think it will continue to be seen. Now, people talk about this AI. I don't care if it's AI or um, analytics in a very simple way of just sorting. Or, or more complex analytics, or just straight um, COBOL. I mean, I, I know some of you may be too young to remember COBOL. But my point is, automation by whatever technique. Oh, you do remember, Jose, Antonio? I saw your hand go up. OK. It's something you read about in, in a history book. Just kidding. Anyway, my point just is that I believe technology collectively will continue to have impacts on every facet of our lives that the rate at which they will will increase more likely than stay the same or even decrease, although COVID makes an argument that it could decrease in some ways as well. Our supply chains, I don't know how you're doing in South America, but our supply chains have been disrupted. Now, for those of us that can afford it, it makes little difference. To people that are relatively less well off, it can make a really big difference You know, in terms of what's available. We have something in the United States called food deserts. These are areas in poor subsets of our cities where there are no grocery stores in, in within a mile. It's defined as having no grocery store within about two miles of where you live. That's called a, a, a food desert. So one of the things that's really interesting is more and more people are using hydroponic growth in inner cities to start having fruits and vegetables that are available for people who live there. This is a technology, an important technology. We can do this in, in part because our information tech, excuse me, information technologies allow not just random, but very targeted practices that let people maximize the value of the inputs to develop more outputs. The second is, I think in general, how we study the future. Now, those of you uh, like Alex, Indira, and myself, and probably many of you others that have been around a fair amount of time have been well trained in what I call research of the past. We do surveys, maybe edging into the present a little bit. We do surveys, we do experiments, we do um, um, archival data, we do um, interviews, we do cases. We're looking at what's happening now, how people feel now, mainly about what's happened in the past. It's not bad, it's helpful. But the kinds of techniques we use like statistics, like p-values, like hypothesis tests, miss the whole point of studying the future. Many times, if I make a prediction, it's because I want it to be wrong. 
If I predict Y2K will be a disaster, I want it to be wrong. If I predict global warming will go up five degrees Fahrenheit, two degrees centigrade, and destroy our coasts, I want it to be wrong. Meaning I want it to scare the blank out of people and start taking action to, to do something that will make a better future. Same thing with the robot apocalypse. Although there's as many people who look forward to robots as you know fear them. But we want, I think, talking about robots to make decisions and take actions so that they serve our purposes rather than condemn us to an even worse future than the present. And I think the present is, at least for me personally, is a lot better than the past. And I think that's, in utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. I think more people have risen out of poverty than fallen into it. But on the other hand, this is an empirical question. I don't know the answer. My point is studying the future has different premises than studying the past. So I don't believe we can take what we know about research relative to the past and apply it without significant thought and adjustment to studying the future. Now, it's not my goal today to talk in detail about methods for studying the future. You'll have to invite me to, back if you want to hear about that. But that will happen next year. Well, Alex, I'm, I'm already I've noted. Got, I've got so little to do that uh, anytime you want. Uh, I'm happy to come back if, if, if it's, you know, if they're not demanding that you find somebody else. Um, so in the short term, there are many techniques like forecasting and math, looking at what's going on now and projecting it into the future. Now we can project it not only linear, but we can add um, other numerical uh, modeling techniques to look at, well, what if this continues at twice the rate or at an exponential rate? We can look at it with what if analysis, uh, many different scenarios. But in the long term, we are not so much about prediction as we are about what's called values clarification. What is it that we want? So I'm going to make the assumption that if we have a time when no human labor is needed, we'd like to have a future where humans are, are still, or even more valued uh, th than they are, that humans have purpose, that we have choices, that we have a collaboration with the robots and each other rather than are dominated by them. You know, a really interesting uh, uh, a concept is at some point, if robots and AI have consciousness, and I don't say consciousness is the same as humans, but equivalent, maybe, or maybe the same, who knows? It, it probably won't be in my lifetime, but it could be in yours. If we have a situation where robots have consciousness, we have no laws protecting robots. You know, it's like look at poor R2D2 in Star Wars. They're kicking that poor thing around. A C3PO loses his head in every film. It's a disgrace. Humans can be embarrassed about so many things. Now, fortunately, we assume they don't have consciousness now. But at some point, we may not even know when they do. It's not too late to start thinking about what are the rights that robots should have. Now, at this point, most humans can't claim, I don't know about most, an awful lot of humans can't claim the rights that they should have. So maybe that's a higher priority. You know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, people in, in refugee camps, people in poverty zones. Um, I know uh, the U.S., we have on average the highest, one of the higher standards of living, but we also have the highest distribution of any country. So relative to our economics, we have some of the really poor people, even if you compare what they actually own physically and, and not. I lived for Africa in, in Africa for two years, many decades ago, and, and I saw very clearly how these statistics are just don't tell the whole story. But I don't mean to go off on a socioeconomic rant here. Okay. So these are my two things. How does technology change what work is, means, how we respond to it, and what does it mean to study the future? I, I mentioned that it's hard to study the future in part because there is no data. The one workaround people have developed is we can study what people think the future will be now, right? We can do surveys of people and what they think uh, you know, work will be like in 20 years. And this does not tell us what work will be like, but it does tell us what people are thinking now about it. And, and that's very important. Now, what will tell us what work will be like? I would say that this is a question of a lot of imagination. 
uh, I think science fiction, actually, for any of you who, who, who like to read this, is a great indicator of what's possible. And it's not about crowds or crowdsourcing. It's about imagine that people are often um, social pariah that are not like uh, mainstream people who think about these things in a, in, a, in a rather strange way. And it's interesting to look back at science fiction and see the immense number of things that were impossible not verified scientifically, not even given a pathway when they were when they were introduced, that are now everyday facts. And some have been facts for so long, it's like they're just a part of the world, like submarines and balloons that can go around the world in 80 days. Uh, we don't have time machines yet, if we ever will. But we don't have a faster than light uh, spaceships. I mentioned something is better to be wrong. We don't all share the same values. Uh, I have met people who believe that competition and poverty are essential to motivate people to work hard. That's not my experience. People, some are, are, are don't like to work, but most people I meet like to work if it it, it, is, it achieves reasonable reward. You know, is not uh, condemned or vilified. And that goes from people doing very menial tasks like the housekeepers uh, in the hospital to the doctors and surgeons. And sometimes people who are very uh, modest by revenue standards in employment get immense satisfaction out of it, and others don't. There's a correlation maybe between status uh, and uh, the kind of work people do or, or self-satisfaction and status, but it's it's a correlation and not a causation in my opinion. Uh, I think something attitudinal is a stronger determiner of that. I've had menial jobs. One of my favorite jobs of all time was I was what was called the um, complaint department specialist at Sears uh, I don't know the equivalent in, in South America uh, or, or in, in, in Mexico, they had something called Carrefour and in France, they have this, which is kind of like a department store. So people would come with every sort of complaint. I loved it because my job was to make them leave happy. Is that the and, ombudsman? Like, Yeah, excellent. Uh, uh, but not for employees, but for the customers. And uh, so uh, we don't share the same values. Therefore, we don't all react to a picture of the future in the same way, right? So an internet that's very controlled would appeal to one group of people where maybe there's a lot of profit, but also a lot of innovation, may appeal to one group of people more than one that's open, but has lots of risks of fake news and manipulation and things. So um, we have different people have different visions of what a good future will look like. And uh, there's a fellow named Habermas or Habermas, German philosopher. He 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 talks about um, three levels of ethics. Oh shoot! I'm sorry. I keep my phone on in case in case I get an the emergency. The music is good. The music is good. You, you choose you. a That's, good ringtone. I dance usually when it comes on, and uh, but I thought I'd spare you from the the, the visual blight. So it's three levels of he calls it uh, morality, ethics, and pragmatism. Morality is sets of what are called maxims or rules. And his view is these are derived by discourse and discourse and premise is everybody who's ever lived of coming to agreement that these things are true. Now, of course, that's not possible, but just like numbers going to the limit in calculus, we can approach it as closely as we can by having more stakeholders involved, more discussion, more people involved over time. Anyway, I don't think we ever will have um, uh, maxims that people agree on un uniformly, but I think we can have ones that more and more people uh, do agree on and that are worth um, uh, living by. What the world will be like in the future comes gradually and has many, many influences. It's almost impossible, there's so many influences, to know what the influence of each piece was. I write a lot about causality and why causality is not the appropriate um, the appropriate measure or standard for research in behavioral or artificial sciences. Um, I can't, you know, uh, what's the cause of me wearing glasses? Uh, well, it, you could say it's because my eyes are bad, but it could also be because my doctor recommended them, or it could also be because I found a pair that fits that in my price range, and on and on, on. There are dozens of things that influence, in my opinion, wearing simple thing like wearing glasses. I don't know how you would find something that caused it aside from a dozen other things that also caused it. But I'll let that go at the moment. So I would say there are many, many influences and finding the range of those and maybe even how much influence each has in a particular instance 
or across a, a set of instances has value. Um, because the future comes gradually, the timing of, of what we're talking about becomes quite important. If we're talking about next year, five years, or 50 years, 50 years, we'll never know the answer. But we may see that we're moving in a trajectory toward that, or we may not. I don't know a few people who want to do streams of research for 20 years, where they update that research, say, every three years. Uh, I've recommended this to a number of people. And, you know, we're, we all tend to be much more short-term oriented. And if we can publish something each three-year period, maybe we'll do that. But after 20 years, it may or may not be that anybody would be interested. It depends. I mean, if, if you look at um, uh, a technology like um, word processing machines, they're gone now. If you started studying that 25 years ago, it'd be worthless now, right? Other than historically, how it, how it disappeared. All right. Uh, this is Thomas J. Watson. Um, it's so easy for uh, predictions to go wrong. He was the head of IBM. He predicted at one point there would be only five computers in use anywhere in the world. I mean, we, we have more than five in our car if we have a car. We probably have more than five in my radio. I don't know if that's really true. But um, I don't know what the average house has now, but I know it's much more than five. So it's really easy to look stupid if you make a big prediction. You know, even in his lifetime, he looked really stupid because of this one. Now, I'd argue that a good framework for thinking about work in the future is coevolution. Coevolution means the technology changes, and at the same time, our understanding and preferences regarding work change. And as they each change, they change each other. So, you know, we've gone to Zoom and Google Teams or whatever, um, and that's changed the way we work. And the way we work has changed our understanding of how to use these technologies. Now, I wrote a paper with two colleagues where we look at the major platforms of IT and found that they've each gone through three stages when it comes to work. The first stage is people interact with the technology directly. In other words, uh, something like embedded computing, they would write the um, programs to embed computing in things like uh, brake and brake systems in the car. The second are people who write interfaces so that an engineer can use a tool to deal with that code that affects the brakes. And then the third are people who use that interface in order to know nothing about the code and yet help us make brakes or other designs. And we found this same pattern happen for each of these platforms, and we predict this will continue with each new platform. So what does that mean to you as a teacher or possibly as a practitioner? It means that the platforms that are emerging now, and I don't know if blockchain could be considered a platform, uh, I think that um, Internet of Things can be considered a platform that's emerging. I think games and gamification is a platform. So each of these platforms, one can predict, is likely to go through this series of steps. People designing games, people who write programs to make games easier to design, which I know already exist, and then people who make games to do things using the interface. And, and so it's just an example. So that's a way to think about emerging technologies and how to capitalize on them. So if you're designing curriculum, this has the implication that if you make a bet on a platform, you can look at what technologies you can use. So this is just one of a number of things that I've written and that we propose as ways to think about uh, the evolution of work. Because if technology is a little bit easier to predict, or at least specific technologies, then work can be viewed as a reaction to that. But while people are working, they think of new ways to make the technology better. So you can always use changes in workplace and work habits as a way to make predictions about the technology. So um, as technology appears, we can begin planning for future needs. Now, the big danger in all this, of course, is that we have technologies that appear and then fizzle out. Uh, I doubt that blockchain will do that, but how that's interpreted in IS uh, is, is a, 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 and engineering uh, and in computer science are going to be three different answers. Um, and it will range all the way from probably computer science, uh, especially working with the technology directly, building better ways to do blockchain, making it take less energy, things like that. People who make interfaces so that companies can buy their own version of blockchain and develop their own internal 
um, uh, you know, uh, databases, and then people who um, commercialize different, you know, like their own versions of Bitcoin in a variety of different fields in order to do that. Now, thinking about skills and work, not all technologies will generate identical sets of skills. So there are really three kinds of ways to think about skills in terms of this model. One is there are some things that will always be important, but they won't be necessarily the things people get hired for, which are creativity, continual learning, um, applying the things you've learned in the past productively to new things while letting things that no longer apply slip away. This is an un uh, in, in underestimated skill, you know, learning is about when you when you're upgrading, learning is about uh, capitalizing on what you know and not repeating things you don't know unproductively for too long. Attention to detail, an ability to communicate, to read instructions and to uh, provide instructions and things like this. These are constant, but I would argue that none of these in a vacuum is as helpful as when you match it to the very particular instances of technology you're talking about. Being able to write about blockchain means understanding blockchain. So the ability to learn blockchain is fundamental to being able to communicate about it. Being able to communicate means knowing what people who are listening to you or reading you are going to need to understand what you've learned about the technology. This is a different skill, in my opinion, than either understanding blockchain or understanding communication. It's how to integrate the two. But I have never seen anybody hire for that, but it's very valued once people are on the job and, and are using it. There will be things that are specific to a new technology that have not been important to any others. The specific grammar, the way that the computer integrates that code, uh, tricks that are specific to getting things to run that aren't in the manual. But then there are things that are technological because all computers still have to break everything down to zeros and ones. They still have to store um, uh, data. They have to integrate uh, different nodes and, uh, on networks. And so understanding at a mental model level how these things work should transfer and be augmented as you go. So this is how I think about uh, technology and how I would go about setting up a curriculum. I can go on and on about this. I think in terms of curriculum, we have not in my school learned anywhere near what we could of the lessons from COVID. People are so eager to go back to what they did before as if, as if that's a, a good option. It is a good option if you're really lazy. No offense if that's an option if any of you prefer. But in my opinion, many of us, including me, I built up a library of videotapes. Now they want me to ignore that and make the same lectures over and over again, waste everybody's time. But now that I made the tapes, what do I do with them that really enhances student learning? And I don't know the answer to that, but I do know there are people who can do that really well and um, and, and write about that and publish that in, in my journal. Uh, I invite any of you that knows and has good ways to convert a library. I'll tell you, for example, at our school, we probably have 10 faculty in our entrepreneurship program that each have a library. Why wouldn't we on day one, when somebody signs up for the program, make all of that available to them and then guide them individually or in small groups through different pathways through it so that we maximize small group learning instead of having lectures. Um, let me go on here. This is just a picture of coevolution. So if you think about the next step with this, we can look at and list literally dozens of computing trends depending on how much detail you want to get into. We can also list numerous people trends. Now, I've organized computing trends into three subsets, interfaces, platforms, and uh, devices, and data and analytics. So this goes to input-output, processing, and storage. But it's a little bit more nuanced than that, I think. People trends are things like our mode of work. Do we go to the office? Do we work at home? How do we get paid? Are we what's called free agents or do we work for a salary? I know about in South America, but fewer and fewer people in the United States across all of the professions, as far as I know, are being hired full time to work 40 hour weeks. Uh, more and more people are hired for a particular job. 
you know. And uh, in our school, um, our ratio of what are called adjunct teachers to full-time professors is just increasing, more and more adjunct. Now, the, the full-time teachers are supposed to, in addition to teaching classes, run the school. And of course, this is a big point of contention because, well, I don't want to go into that in too much detail, but it's a big, it's a big issue. But throughout all of work, when people become more and more transactional, you do this, I pay you for this, rather than I want you to cover a territory and create a result, and I'm going to take care of a lot of your uh, worker needs. Uh, this is very different, okay? Skills that I've talked about change. Um, I've talked about automation replacing skills, like for the doctor, rather than jobs in a lot of cases. So this requires a company, an organization, to think about, well, what is a teacher now? So uh, at some of our more progressive high school and elementary schools for kids, uh, they don't do things with one you know, classroom sitting in rows. They have pods of kids working on different things. The teacher is not a lecturer as much as a three ring circus master. And they're not responsible for lectures, but they're responsible at the end of the year that kids have learned and to tailor all this for their particular kids, right? And I don't know how they do it. It's beyond me. They're young and they have energy. So we should learn from this stuff. When elementary schools are more advanced and progressive than universities, we as a society, now hopefully you're different, but we as a society have some, some explaining to do. Anyway, so to give you a little more detail on this, people trends, I see one is crowds. Decisions and actions are often taken more by crowds and co-creation. New products and services are almost universally now developed through a partnership by companies and their customers or other stakeholders, right? It's many forms, many different ways this happens. I'm doing a study right now interviewing people about how they do this. Um, hopefully, I'll have some answers for you in three years. Um, IT is everywhere. There's almost no such thing anymore as an IT worker. Yes, there are people who still specialize in developing, in managing hardware, uh, selling uh, computer devices as vendors, uh, doing computer contracts, but there's almost no jobs that don't involve computers anymore uh, and information and content. Uh, so um, it's made a situation where it used to be, we looked at IT workers and everybody else, but now it's a continuum. Uh, uh, systems architects, I think are still pretty clearly IT workers or computer scientists, um, people that use a digital uh, sh Photoshop to make web designs are also IT workers but completely divorced from any kind of coding or hardware. Specialization will continue as well as convergence. People will have, th there are estimated, last I saw, tw 12 million IT workers in the United States alone. And who knows what they count and don't count. I think they count software vendors and anybody that works for them, because I don't think they really have a good way to, to determine this, but it's millions of people that are uh, working. Some people are so specialized, they do nothing but you know, a what if analysis or um, pivot charts. Um, but others try to integrate these things. And I believe the trends in both directions will continue. There'll be more and more specialization and as there is more need to integrate those things. Uh, technical skills. I don't think they'll ever stop being needed for technical skills. When students ask me what they should study, I say, if you don't care about the content, I don't think there will ever be a time when cybersecurity is not needed. Um, People who want to take advantage of the system are, they'll work twice as hard as having a real job to steal half as much money. And I say they because I don't put myself in any way in their camp except being fascinated by technology. Uh, so um, uh, I think cybersecurity is the most secure field, subfield to go into, whether it's designing new, um, uh, what do they call those things, that, that look at data as it comes into your firm. Um, Sorry, uh, new firewalls, firewalls, whether it's writing new firewalls or it's training people to not click on nasty um, emails. I don't think that will ever disappear. I don't think there will ever disappear data specialists, meaning people who make sure that the databases are created and working, have good throughput. Uh, I think that's so fundamental. I don't think that computer technicians will ever disappear, uh, but more and more of this is also being automated. Um, I think that innovation will continue. I mentioned the time when computers can do everything humans can. 
But I think we have a number of alternatives. One is we can create much more customized activity. So for example, if I can't afford uh, anything but frozen vegetables at the store uh, or foraging in the, the woods, I'll do that. But if I'm getting paid enough for whatever I'm doing or getting paid to just mope around, I may go to somebody who grows their own vegetables and makes one of a kind combinations, uses their own formulas. So there may still be a role for customization. And, and another role, so Alex mentioned this before we started, uh, if Google or Amazon may start paying me for the information they collect every time I shop. And that may uh, create a virtuous cycle so that my shopping provides enough income to do more, fish, more shopping. You Thank know? you, Fred. You just made my self-esteem come back. You know, now I, I, I feel like I'm working for Amazon and not just give, get, getting a stipend from them uh, so that I can keep buying things from them in the future, even if I don't have a job. Exactly, Alex. I mean, wouldn't you delight in being paid to buy stuff? I tell you, it's harder sometimes than you think. Um, I, I was the chair of SIG, AC, SIG MIS for ACM. We have a large surplus of funds. And my job for four years was to spend the money, but of course, only on things that were legitimate, um, of value to our, our community. And it's harder than it sounds because you have to put in place the auditing, you have to people, anyway, the launcher is not here to complain, but spending money can be very uh, interesting as a, as a, you know, and there are people who like, um, will do your shopping for you, right? If you pay them for it. Anyway, I don't need to go into too much detail about that, but. It's interesting to think about what models could exist that, you know, it may be an affront to us in terms of our lack of privacy, but people in their 20s and 30s take a lack of privacy for granted. And people in different countries have different values about privacy. I saw a paper comparing a study of people in China and in the U.S. And the responses to many things were quite different about the expectation of participation in um, community activity versus individualism. Um, so I just, I mentioned that. Um, I go into a lot of detail about different sorts of uh, people trends. I mentioned free agents in terms of contracting for work rather than having a real job. This, this is directly affected to the tools people use. If you're working from home, there are tools that are essential. There are other tools that are nice to have. You might be able to do a certain amount of work and then send it in a batch to your office, or you may need to do things in real time. These require different tools. How adept you become in tool at certain tools, how you learn, how you innovate your use when they don't work the way you want. These are all elements of this free agent activity. A work balance, I haven't talked about much. Um, I know that there are times when, when I'm at work, at school, which is infrequently anymore because I work at home mostly now, um, I'll want to stop for a while and do something like order a book from Amazon, say, or Barnes and Noble is a big company we have up here. Um, and there's absolutely nothing that prohibits me from doing that. It's said that at high tech companies, people have a lot of freedom to say at three o'clock, order a, a dinner and have it delivered when they get home at six or whatever uh, it might be. Um, so the blending of time, and, and a lot of people who work at home may work for a couple hours, do home activities, work for a couple hours, or be interrupted. And so the pattern of life, say working at home, working in, in your regular job, the, these things have already had impact. But my guess is that there are enough people who see whatever they're at now as not what they'd like that there's great room for innovation. And it could be through tools. It could be through alternative ways to work. And it could be uh, just new imagination of, of what work is and contains. Uh, so questions that go along with this that are worthy of research, I think, is how do individuals allocate their time when they're free to allocate it any way they want? How much should organizations think about ways to constrain that if they have a reason to? Why would you constrain it and why would you not? Now, I do know some people who, if they're not constrained, actually have a hard time that, that need a structure. Now, you can learn to structure something and then pretend like you can't just change it. 
but many people just need a structure and, or, or they're not productive. And, and so um, th this can always vary, I think. And, and how do people, I mean, you know, it's very interesting, the difference between equality and equity. Carolyn, I see you lit up. Did you want to say something? Yes, um, actually, I have a question. <clears throat> and when you say work-life balance, um, a, a thing that comes to my mind is how important is still for a human being to have a, um, a constant paycheck you know, on work-life balance? I mean, um, we say <clears throat> that um, jobs are changing. We're going to work for tasks. We, don't, we will not have jobs as we had before with um, monthly paychecks. But um, that instability of um, revenue for a person can also, I think, affect the work-life balance. Um, how is that um, being uh, viewed? Thank you very much for an excellent question. Um, so I think that, so I teach in an entrepreneurship program to a large extent. I don't teach MIS much anymore. I teach innovation, project management, things like that. So in the entrepreneurship class, we get maybe five out of 20 people who want to be entrepreneurs because about 15 out of 20 don't really want that much risk in their life. So if we have a society that moves toward more and more risk to the individual, I, I would make a guess, although it's an empirical question, somewhere between half and three-fourths of people will not like that. And about a fourth to half of people may not know how much they'd like that or already know. Now, it seems like for individuals, the best bet is to try things out and to see. I have some acquaintances who are entrepreneurs. They knew they would never want to work for anybody after their first internship. So the freedom, if you want to call it that, of not working for somebody else balances the risk of being an entrepreneur. There's a very good book um, uh, called The Black Swan. And it's it's about a lot of it's about taking a risk. And he says a lot of times we think that things that are risky are really less risky. So he has friends that are cab drivers, and if they want to make more money, they work more. And he has other friends that have hundreds of thousands of dollars in stocks, and tomorrow, if it all goes to zero, they're finished. So he talks a lot about resilience, what's come to be known as resilience. And um, so I would say this, number one, people vary. I would guess as a starting point, there's a normal curve between high risk takers and low risk takers. And I would guess that between zero and 50% of people don't know where they are because they haven't tried. I consider myself far on the anti-risk side. I would hate being uh, working for piecemeal. Okay. Um, I'm old enough, I would probably just retire, but you know, uh, it, it, that would not be my choice. That's why I'm not an entrepreneur. I tell my students this immediately. And so, uh, I'm one of the teachers for the people who will never be entrepreneurs, but still like to study about it. And, and it's a very good rounded, you know, topic. Okay. So did I answer your question? Okay. You disappeared from my screen, so I, I can't see if. I don't know if Caroline is probably something happened to her computer, I think, uh, because I think she, she's out of the call. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. I, I clicked on something to see if she would show up, but, um, well, let's just assume I answered the question well. She's, she, did I answer you know, she's there, she's there. I lost connection. <laughs> My internet is very unstable today, and I lost connection. I will um, see your answer uh, on the recording. I'm so sorry, Fred. Oh, okay. That, that, that's great. I don't know the answer <laughs> until I say it, so I could probably give you two sentences, but if there's any other questions, I'm happy to address anything anybody has. Alex, have you got anything over the chat? No, we don't have. Uh, no, no, we don't have. Uh, I mean, we have some uh, over the chat. We have uh, people that have made some observations. There was one that was very interesting uh, uh, by Andrea. She said, but it was right at the beginning. She said, prediction, not narration, is the real test of our understanding of the words. And then she quotes Nassim Nicola Taleb. Uh, oh, but it was just a comment. That's yeah. funny, because he's the author of the book on the black swan. Yeah. But it was before you mentioned it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's a coincidence. <laughs> uh, oh, that's Andrea who's, who made the comment. Yeah, that, that's Andrea. That's Andrea. Andrea had made the comment before on, on the chat. She was actually commenting to the group here, you know, like you're talking there and we are all gossiping there at the, the chat. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Andrea, would you want to elaborate what you meant? 
I'm uh, I'm sorry. I can't uh, turn my camera on right now. I'm I'm sorry, but well, I I really like uh, uh, Taleb's books, as you mentioned, uh, the, the the Black Swan and also Anti Fragile right now. Yeah. And I don't know. I just I was uh, trying to connect the dot of what you were saying and some uh, things that he he writes and he defends, and I found some parallels. So some parallels. So I'm. I don't know. I, I'm just enjoying it, everything you were talking about because I'm a, I'm a trans researcher. I, I work with consumer trends, and oh. I really love that subject. So thank you very much. It's well, been very very for, nice. Being compared to Taleb is a great honor. Um, uh, I I love reading his books not because I agree with everything, which of course I don't. <laughs> but over and over again, he causes me to think about things in different ways. I love his anecdote about the mafioso. Do you guys use that term? Um, yes. the, the, ma yeah. the mafia guy who, uh, instead of like lifting weights and working out, he just one once a week picks up like 200 pounds. I mean, if I did that, I'd have a hernia. Um, I'd be in the hospital. But I do find I, I love having a garden. And uh, I my trees, my fruit trees are just far enough away that the sprinklers don't catch them. So I pick up a five to 10 gallon, I don't know what it is, um, thing of water uh, and water each tree by hand whenever it gets dry out. And um uh, so I always think of him and his example. You know, it's it's probably I don't know if it's good exercise or not, but it makes me feel virtuous. Yeah, Any and other... uh, can I I ask you something just out of curiosity? Yeah, uh, he said that he doesn't consider uh, COVID and all the pandemic a black swan. And uh, what do you think about that? Because he, I, I he said think that, that he is correct. I think coming. That... You think? Okay. Well, it's it's like you. It's like earthquakes and typhoons, and uh, you don't know exactly where or exactly when earthquakes. But, you know, I, I think one of his strongest points pertains to resilience. And in IT, what I interpret this as is never design anything thinking it will be foolproof or errorproof. Assume you're going to have errors. Design it to be recoverable. And I, I think, I, I don't know if he says that exactly, but... In IT, I think this, so for example, take AI and ethics. I don't think you can develop an AI that will not harm somebody at some point, like the driverless car will run over somebody. Airplanes crash, you know? I mean, we don't want it. Every time an airplane crashes, they send teams of people to investigate, find out what the uh, lessons are, and make airplanes better and make training better. I mean, we have less deaths from airplane accidents now than we did 50 years ago. And we have much more complex airplanes. It seems to me with AI, what you want to do is have anybody introducing AI in the workplace should have to pay for insurance or what we call a bond. So if somebody's harmed, they get paid immediately, like somebody harmed in a car crash. I don't know if you have insurance the same way we do, but we have what's called no fault insurance. So it doesn't matter whose fault it was, you get paid. We have really lousy healthcare insurance, but if you have good healthcare insurance, you get paid whether you caused it or not. People fight about this and they decide who pays, but in the meantime, you're taken care of. So I think it should be the same with AI, that you have a big fund that everybody who develops AI pays into. Uh, 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 people who run the fund pay out money when uh, harm has been shown. And it's a responsibility of, of, the, of the people who created the harm to fix it and to show that it's been fixed. Now, to me, that's uh, resilience. And that would be a, a, a reason. And, you know, I don't want to be the one who has the surgery go bad because the AI made a mistake. But on the other hand, I tend to think I have a better chance with a surgeon AI team than either just AI or the surgeon, even now. And I think that if we start on AI and accept some risk, that eventually we'll, we'll come out of it. Now, regarding the uh, pandemic, we actually went a long time without a big pandemic. We're extremely lucky that others like, um, uh, what was that one in Africa that people die really fast? Um, Ebola? Ebola, that that got contained. Yeah. The SARS-CoV-1, right? Sorry? The SARS-CoV-1, right? Was, yeah, SARS-CoV-1, uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, people in Taiwan dealt really well with the pandemic because they were already prepared, right? Um, even in New Zealand and Australia, they were relatively prepared. Um, and um, 
I don't want to get into politics because I, I know um, you guys have some of the same structural things going on that we do in the States. Uh, but, um, you know, sometimes we humans are our own worst enemy. And um, uh, so um, my, my great fear is that we won't learn the lessons as we haven't in the past, you know. Another really good book, if you have the time and interest, is called The, Newing, the Knowing Doing Gap. Show it to you. I keep it on my shelf. Whoops. Oh, it's backwards. Wait, let me turn. No, it didn't help. I don't know if you see it forwards or backwards, but um, it's it's a great book. It's by two Stanford professors. And, and basically what they say is over and over and over again, we know the answer. We know what to do, and we don't do it. Now, unfortunately, they give 100 examples of this without telling us what the solution is. So whoever comes up with the solution to how to get people to do what they know to be effective or right will be the next, you know, Elon Musk. Or they'll be the next Joan of Arc. I don't know. Anyway, thank you, uh, Andrea, for, for the comment. Did I address it okay? Yeah, of course. Thank you very, very much. Another one is called the unrolling of the generations. Uh, what do I mean? People will say things like, uh, uh, humans will never accept driverless cars. Now, that may be true for people my age. It may be half true for people your age. But people that are 16 years old now, by the time they're your age, it may be just normal to them. You know, one interesting thing, Fred, is that, for example, I have a 16-year-old uh, son. Well, he's actually he, he's actually into driving, but my, my daughter, who's 20, 24, she thinks that uh, well, she, she hates driving, which you know, if, from our, our generation, that was an expression of freedom to be able to drive, right? For them, she says Uber whenever she can, and after we have automated cars, that will be her dream. You know? So I, I, I do think that pro probably already uh, a portion, uh, a fraction of, of the population would go very easy with respect to having uh, uh, driverless cars. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a subset of people, I don't think there's that many, maybe tens of thousands, who buy what are called recreational vehicles. And they're like these large trailers on a, and you can drive them, but you can't really park them much of anywhere but a big parking Motor lot. Motor homes, right? Motor homes. Yeah. Uh, they're, they graduate to a size where you can't really move them. And we call those trailers. And, and people tend to live in what are called trailer parks. But I think when we have driverless mobile homes, uh, a retired person like me could buy one and just tell it, you know, let's let's um, in a week from now, I want to be in New York and see a play. You know, Alexa, would you reserve tickets for me? And then you get like maybe a one person or a two person golf cart. And, and you let it drive you to the theater and back, you know, that's assuming you can afford all this, of course. But or, or you, you, you have like kiosks, uh, you, you park at a Walmart. You guys have Walmart in Mexico. I know I don't know about South America. Um, we do have Walmarts around here, but now they belong to Carrefour, for what I know. Oh, well, you're Carrefour then. So you park at one of those at the periphery of the city. You get out. They have a kiosk. You get into one of their self-driving, you know, golf carts, and, and then you take it where you need to go. It goes pick somebody else up. Another one comes, like a Uber, Uber without a driver. And, um, um, you know, in a way, we could have even more freedom. And, you know, I was against driverless cars. Until somebody said, well, you know, we have 55,000 people die in the United States alone, traffic accidents every year. And um, driverless cars could cut that down to 5,000. So there's a lot of worry about, well, you know, do you kill the, the person in your car or the pedestrian if you have to? Well, what would this come up one, one time every 100 years? I, I don't know. But I do think there'll be a period where driverless cars have accidents. I know we, Tesla's had accidents. And there'll be lawsuits, but if you build that in, I, I think you get constant improvement, and eventually they'll be much safer than driving on, on, on for the us driving. Um, so I don't know how I got to that, but anyway, unrolling the generations means I think that many decisions have to take into account not where we are, but where we might be. And that we should really emphasize young people in things like our surveys. Now, to me, you're all young people, but uh, young people from your perspective. Uh, 
and and and, and so on. Um, you know, when I was a kid, if you had a tattoo in the United States, it meant you were a, a beatnik or a derelict or a bum. Now, uh, you know, if you go to parts of California, you're the odd one if you don't have a tattoo. Um, we went to um, a part of St. Louis. Uh, they, they had an opening for a new, you know, uh, uh, place where there's a lot of restaurants and shops and things. And everybody, but my wife and I had tattoos. I mean, everybody. And it's like, you know, there is a, when you go to, um, if, if you, when you were 16, wrote something you regret now on Facebook, and you go for a job, the employer may find what you wrote when you were 16, if you erased it. Okay. So by the time Alex's kids are 30, it will just be assumed that you've written naughty things on Facebook. And people shrug and say, well, Good, you had some spirit. You know, you weren't just a, a drudge or a clone. I don't know if that's really going to happen, but I don't take for granted that it won't. So um, I think we can measure, going back to baby boomers or maybe even earlier, when people started thinking about generations. Because the generation, the concept of generation really started when the change accelerated to the point where what old people knew was no longer completely true. Now we get to a point where young people are clearly teaching us, old people. And we can tell stories because it's entertaining, but we're rarely in about eternal values, if you believe in that. But we're not telling stories about how to, you know, uh, set up your new computer, right? We, I, I struggle through this. And uh, so the enrolling of the generations, I, I tell people, are there characteristics that vary from one generation to another. Can we look at and define all of the different, the range that every different characteristic can take? Then can we look at the set of all the combinations and define all the possible ways that, that the standard unchanging things are like for each generation, for future generations? And then we can begin to narrow down and see how are generations likely to evolve? You know, I don't have the time or patience to do the study, but I think it'd be a great one for somebody that wants to do it. Just let me know. I'll tell you everything I know and thought about uh, in this regard. Uh, and, and then you can do it. Anybody who's on the call. Um, I may not remember most of you by name. No offense. I just meet and talk to too many people. But you can always go through Alex to get to me, I, I believe, uh, or at least as long as we're on speaking terms. Um, OK. Um, now, IT development is a good example of a thing all of us are concerned with that's been evolving. You know, a lot of people forget that in the early days, the way people wrote computer programs is one person sat down and wrote it. And this was actually better than what replaced it for a subset of programs where the writer was a genius. But what happened is, even then, no one understood the code, and it was very expensive to maintain. So independently, a dozen consulting firms invented structured programming, structured design, and this became known as the system development lifecycle, or traditional approach. This was developed to answer the problems that came before. And you know what? All the problems that it solved came back when we went to Agile. Problems of code that couldn't be maintained problems of lack of documentation, problems of um, uh, throwing away early versions and having to start over. Now, on average, Agile for customer-facing programs outperforms traditional. I'm convinced from the research I've seen. There's no doubt it has a place. But you know, a developed method has to fit into an overall organizational context. And this has been very hard for companies that want to switch from entirely traditional to entirely agile. Companies that retain about 70% traditional can do the agile as kind of a separate embedded part of their, of their, of their systems. Anyway, the point is that pure agile is done by almost nobody. Traditional is not done by almost anybody anymore. So we have what are called hybrids. And often these hybrids will have five components of Agile and five of, uh, of traditional. 
And if you add them all up, there are hundreds of combinations. So someone by default can manage to come up with a hybrid or someone on purpose can develop a particular set that works in their environment. Now the problem with 70% uh, traditional, 30% agile is that they each require different management practices, different staffing, and different training. So there can be overhead and expense in trying to make two different systems uh, of doing this. But on the other hand, going full force into either one can have suboptimal design for a subset of the programs that you're, that you're trying to do. I just wrote a paper. I don't know if you'll find this interesting or not. You know, traditional grounded theory, you interview some number of people lightly, and you find commonalities among them. Well, what I did is I found a true expert and interviewed him about 20 times and kept asking him why this and why that and how do you do this. We started out talking about how do you set up a hybrid uh, project. We ended up with a paper uh, that was about 15 you know, single space pages of how to integrate an agile program into a traditional organization. And we, it was it was as much fun as any, as it, it, we just met every day for you know at lunchtime for an hour and a half, uh, for about 20 weeks, and um, you know I call this an agile research methodology. Exactly, I was going to ask you what you call this uh, subversion of ground theory. <laughs> so, you see, I had the privilege, being an old guy and knowing lots of people, to be invited to write any paper I wanted. Could you share this paper with, with us? Um, it's not published yet. It's been accepted. So it hasn't come back. Um, do you guys use ResearchGate? You know what we can do? Yeah, we can either get in ResearchGate or you send it uh, to me, Fred, and I can include it in our, in our Moodle, which is still closed and nobody else except uh, oh. who's, who's here can I have access to it for now. Yeah, I, the only thing I worry about is copyright and somebody yeah. coming to me and saying I, I don't have the right to. No, but it, it, it's going to be in a closed environment, so they will never be able to, to track yeah. it. It's, it's, it's only for the people who are, who are here with us. Yeah, I'll, if you want me to win, I will, or I can send you the, uh, the, the version. I'll just write on it. This is not the final version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can write there as a working paper or something. And, yeah. yeah, but I, I, we ended up with four different categories of um, lessons pertaining to the organization, pertaining to the individual, pertaining to the tools and techniques, and pertaining to the transition. Uh, and uh, what we found the common denominator is what we call agile mindset. And a lot of people have been writing about this kind of mindset and that kind of mindset lately, digital mindset. And... Mindset is described as the set of beliefs and attitudes and understandings pertaining to a kind of topic. And a digital or an agile mindset pertains to thinking in terms of value rather than technique or specifications. You see what I mean? And this is very, very hard for a senior manager who's worked 25 years under a control and command uh, a, a situation to believe in value rather than to believe in all of the individual. And you can't get the full value from Agile without focusing on customer value rather than sticking to the schedule. So Alex and I started talking before everybody joined about how different people see time differently. Some people look at their watch and that's what time means. Others will look at cues in the environment and respond to them. This is what I experienced living in Africa. It took me uh, more than a year to understand why people would be late to things. Now, some people make a habit of always being 20 minutes late. So they're just as ruled by the clock as I am. It's just they have a different watch. It's set to a different time zone. But there are people who, they don't come to the party until they're dressed right, until their attitude is right, whatever it may be. You see what I mean? And I, I have tremendous respect for that. I, I think that's a... In, you know, in a classroom, I try to do this. I try to follow my topics as they're naturally coming up rather than say I have one minute for this or one minute for that. That's why I'm always off schedule once I start talking. And I've been told by some people that my tangents and stories are the best things about my lectures. But I've also been told it's the absolute worst thing. Uh, so I just say, you know, you can't win. Uh, you just do the best you can. And this is what I like to do. I figure if I like to do it, there's more chance that you'll like hearing it.
uh, but it's certainly not uh, not causal. It's only correlational. Um, okay. So the next thing after hybrid is what, it's, it's what's called DevOps. Are you all familiar with that already? DevOps and continuous releases. Because I don't need to go into a lot of detail, but you can see how as IT development changes, the basic understandings of how to develop new systems carries through. But the specifics of ways to do each of these, the different software that's available to support them, software called Jira. This my confederate, the, the guy I did this um, process with, he said many developers don't want to learn Jira. And once they do, they use Jira to do the same information requirements instead of moving into a value-oriented set of specifications. It's not really specification, but I use the term because it's analogous sort of. So the mindset of the developer for a large percentage is, is attuned to the traditional. And the shift is not about taking a class or about using a tool. It's about what you look to first and how you set out to do things. And, and that's what we emphasized at, at several points in the, in the article. And um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an art that guides a science. You can't ignore the science of development, but the science alone won't, 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 you know, won't deliver the goods. Um, I think project management is almost the purest form of socio-technical um, a work uh, that I know of. Um, I, I was a senior editor for Project Management Journal. I, I, if you're a member of, I believe Project Management Institute is present in South America. I don't know how widespread. Um, there's also an international. Yeah, yeah, is very, yeah, very, very. It's everywhere around here. <laughs> okay, good. So you know they have lots of programs, lots of resources. Um, by the way, they have a grant program for research. And um, I don't know the people anymore because I'm not an editor there anymore. But thinking in terms of what's missing in the project management body of literature. Uh, I, you know, in Brazil, you have a guy in, in northern Brazil who's a very frequent author. His name's escaping me. It's a, it's a classic Portuguese Brazilian name. Uh, Caravel, maybe? I don't know. Um, and he's a very well-known project management uh, writer. Um, and I've never met him in person, but he's he's very well respected. So there's a lot of room for both grants, which Project Management Institute would pay for, and research. Now, Project Management Institute is not concerned about IT projects or about development methods, but they're very concerned about anything as it applies to all projects especially large projects. Now, when I say that, you shouldn't not do research on IT projects, just that when it's being written up, you have to be very conscious of what does everybody get out of that. You see what I mean? What would a construction manager get out of reading this article? Now, it doesn't have to be a lot, but it can't be zero. But but we've we've seen this trend of many of these agile and and well some of the methods that we used in in IT being transferred to other areas and uh, with a with, with mixed uh, results I would say yeah yeah and, and hybrid is very difficult because you know the difference between a list of uh, information requirements and a burn down I don't know what they call it exactly a Kanban list look alike. But they serve different functions, and the way they're managed is different, you know. And anyway, on the other way, uh, Fred, uh, I've seen, for example, IS now using Kanban, but uh, it seems that it's not used uh, uh, to the let's say to the uh, to, to the original uh, uh, concepts of the you know the quality control or, or at least the quality assurance uh, groups and and everything. So sometimes when, when we bring things from from one area to others, it seems that something is missing in the middle of the way. I don't know if you have that feeling also. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Kanban is, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a mental, it's, it's an agile mindset. Uh, and I have to use the agile, not just agile development, but an agility mindset. 
that can shift from information requirements as what you measure and, and what you do to how do I create the most value? And um, um, we talked about this a lot. It took me a lot of, of time to understand what uh, Michael was talking about in this, you know. Um, he's a great teacher. He teaches in our program, uh, but he teaches project managers where I teach in the business school. So I'm teaching people who are not going to be project managers, what they should know about project management. He's teaching people that are already project managers but need to pass the exams, you know. So his view is sort of, well, at the end of this, they'll pass the exams, but I want them to have a deeper understanding at the same time. The project management is not inside the business school? Um, we have one class in project management inside the business school that I teach for non-project managers, like for accountants and for IT people. Um, it's an elective. It is part of, no, it's only one part of only one program do they get credit for it. But I still get between 15 and 20 students a semester, whenever I teach it, that want to study it because they see their future work involving projects. Maybe five out of 20 think they might want to be a project manager. And I tell them the first day, at the end of this, you will not be qualified to be a project manager. In fact, what I tell you will be more about how to challenge the standard thinking as well as what the standard thinking is. For example, the book says a manager and a leader are two different things. I say, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want Alex to leave in a naughty word if I say it, but it's um, what we call bovine excrement. Um, he'll translate that for you if, if you need it. And um, um, it's it's ridiculous. I think people would understand better if you just said bullshit. <laughs> <Okay>, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I could just have an hour of, of saying that word over and over again, the way uh, the way you may edit it. So I'm not going to. And then my dean doesn't need to see this either. But my point just is that. Um, well, I had a point back somewhere. Um, oh, so you're, my you're getting worse than me, you know, uh, you're, you're so hyper textual that you, that you end up not knowing where you started from. <laughs> it happens to yeah, us. Don't worry. Yeah, I don't have a good return button. Um, so, um, but my point about that was that um, what's in the book is what you need to pass the exam. But if you're a accountant and you're doing projects like setting up audits of companies, you don't need 75% of what's in the book. And, and you, what you need is a lot of applied common sense. You need to think about culture. You need to think about working with people. This is just straight management apply to a project. You, but you need to think about your stakeholders and stakeholder management. How do you know who your stakeholders are? How do you know who's most important? What do you do with them? Well, I talk a lot about communicating with stakeholders. None of that's in the book. It talks about stakeholders and who they are. How do you do, but then talk about what do you do once you've identified them. Then talk about change management. The last time I read the, um, what do you call it, um, book of knowledge, the word change was not in it. I mean, give me a break, you know? Change managers is an immense part of what a project manager does unless they're thrown off the project as soon as the, the product is developed, which happens. That's another thing is, you know, we talk about project managers as if it's one thing, but it's not. There are people who are involved in the development of a project, see it through, and then wait through all of its implementation. implementation sorry. There's others that are given a finished design told to produce it at minimum cost, the shortest possible time, and then they're measured on that, and then they're off to the next project. So, so that's, so that's, I'm sorry, I've gone off on a tangent about project management, but I think that project management, I wrote a paper that's um, been accepted in uh, Information Technology and People, I don't think it's been published yet, called AI and Project Management. And what I basically say is there are three ways to think about AI. One way is just as a part of general automation. One is the added part of automation that comes with AI that you, you don't quite get. You don't get the machine learning um, ability to sort of self-improve, let's say. And the third is AI is consciousness, which people in business really don't care about. But it gets mixed up in all of the ethics. So I say that from a project manager's point of view, direct participation in project management is going to be irrelevant for 95% of project managers. The exception is if you're actually managing 
projects that use AI as part of the development process or product. Now, now that said, the products of AI, if you're a vendor like Microsoft or uh, Jira, and you're building systems, now for the most part, most people don't use any of the advanced uh, functions anyway. So it's unlikely you're gonna sell a product by its new great functions, unless they're so revolutionary that they save money in time. Microsoft Project is gonna sell largely because it seamlessly interacts with SharePoint and with Excel and Word and all the others. That just adds so much convenience. They have a component for Agile in it, but I don't think anybody uses that. And the way it's designed, as I understand, because I don't, I don't really do projects, I just talk about them. But I've never used it, but my understanding is it's sort of a, if you know what you're doing with Agile, you can use this, but you can also use it very much in the traditional without changing your mindset. Jira is different though. Now, can you build AI into these to add features or actually do a redesign that automatically not only captures all the data of your past projects, but compares it to everybody else's if they're willing to allow you to de-identify de, uh, de data, and then has a recommender system. Uh, I only see a few people on my screen here, but it could say, don't um, don't uh, assign this to Angel. He's, he's done too much these days of that. He needs a new challenge. Assign it to Tiago instead. Uh, Tiago could use this for developmental purposes, right? You see, okay, Angel, you're gone now. Oh, there, there you are, you're back. I hope I pronounced it right. I don't mean to insult you. My my Spanish is terrible, as as my anecdote explained at the beginning. It should be better since I grew up in an area called East Los Angeles, which is almost entirely Mexican Americans. I say Mexican American. These were people third, second, third, fourth generation born in the U.S. Uh, but and and I, ironically, most of the parents did not want their kids to learn Spanish back then. They wanted to assimilate. So we were discouraged, all of us, from learning Spanish. Which is very sad. One of my big regrets in life. I can speak to you in broken French that you won't understand either. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. You look like you have something to say. Well, what I was going to say is that I think that uh, Thiago, at least uh, for his name, uh, he's Brazilian, possibly, so it's Portuguese. Uh, but it could, I, I could be wrong. You know, names in Portuguese and uh, and Spanish are sometimes alike. It's just I'm not sure. C A R J A with a funny letter O. No, you're, 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 you're talking about Thiago, Thiago, I just see here Thiago dos Santos, right? Thiago, if, if, if you can open your mic and, oh, Thiago oh, 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 you can ask Thiago dos Santos. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were referring to the Brazilian researcher. No, 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 I was, oh, sorry. No, I was talking about, because I, I think you were referring to, okay, so, so someone in our call here, and, uh, but Thiago is Brazilian, right, Thiago? Yes, yes, I'm yeah. Brazilian. <laughs> dos Santos is a frequent Portuguese Brazilian name, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I, I say Spanish, but I don't mean to insult those of you that speak Portuguese. No, no, no it's, it's just uh, just uh, because I thought that you were th thinking about Thiago here and thinking maybe because we have a lot of, uh, I mean, students and researchers here from all parts of Latin America, a lot, a lot from Panama, uh, some from Peru, and uh, I see it's from Chile, Bolivia, and so on and so forth. Okay, great. Well, uh, a lot of your last names are very, very uh, much like ones I see in LA all the time. Uh, and, and others, you know, could be from anywhere. I don't even try to guess. Uh, I do try to guess, but I'm embarrassed that I even bought, uh, that I am wrong so much. Um, uh, it seems to me that you uh, that, that you have a, a much more optimistic uh, perspective of work in the future than I do. I, and I consider myself as a, also a, a very optimistic person in general. It's just that I, I have the feeling that you know that some of the trends that I see uh, take us to no jobs for humans. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm optimistic in, in, in thinking that at least uh, when that happens, that uh, the robots or whoever is in charge will be kind enough to give us some 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 pocket money for us to you know keep doing things. And uh, I still think that's the the, the self esteem thing is not well resolved. I don't think that I'll be uh, very uh, comfortable with a situation where Amazon or Google or Microsoft or whoever pays me a stipend so that I keep alive. Uh, you know, watching TV and or, or maybe. Uh, uh, just writing something on the social networks, uh, but I'm. Uh, but I, I have to admit that I'm a little pessimistic with respect uh, to uh, to the future of work, uh, and I wonder from what I mean. Of course, you have been thinking about that much more than I have. Uh, is that only because I'm one of those generations? Uh, you, you see, I mean, you, you sounded a little Kunian to me when you said, "Well, you know, there's all these generations here. Maybe we'll have to wait until these these old people die 
uh, and others can enjoy uh, the the sleep. Yeah. yeah brave new uh, world. So yeah. So so uh, how do you say it in English? I'll the brave new world. Brave new world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the brave new world is as pessimistic as 1984 in painting a future there. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to see what sure. do you think? Is 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 it just because I'm I'm a generation that will have to die before people uh, are, are more comfortable with it with whatever future we have? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that there's a number of possibilities. One is that by the time Brave New World comes, uh, people have adjusted to it. And and to some extent, it's, it's you know, that and 1984 are here in some ways. But, it, but, but even to those authors, they talked about the subset of people who were crushed by it. And if you read 1984 carefully, there are many people who just go about their lives and don't notice one way or the other, you know. Um, I, I like to write that there's a utopian view and a dystopian view, a total horror and wonderful. And every time people have speculated, what's actually been experienced is somewhere in the middle. So you look at internet, the people who invented it had a utopian view. And then we see a lot of dystopian elements. We see people who are strikingly harmed or just excluded. We see others who are immensely benefited. But most of us day in and day out, have just substituted the way we did things once for the way we do them now and are pretty neutral. So part of my answer is that things we may find horrible, our grandchildren may find normal. I don't have any kids, so I don't have grandchildren, so I don't worry about it. Um, so in that sense, I'm optimistic, but by the same token, my expectation is there will be some kind of curve. Let's call it a normal curve for the sake of argument. Uh, people are heavily harmed, People are heavily benefited, and people are everywhere from uh, an, an indifferent trade-off to just don't use it or whatever in the middle. Now, the shape of that curve is to be determined, but that's my expectation. So for me, if I were going to live another 50 years, I'd be pretty optimistic for a couple reasons. One is, unlike you, I love watching television. No, I'm just kidding. But one is that um, I'm, I'm going to retire soon anyway, so I'm already thinking about what am I going to do when I retire. You know, I'm definitely not going to teach because I only teach when I get paid for it. But doing these kind of Zoom sessions with... You no, know, that's not true. Well, you, you know, you, you may not uh, think of this as uh, teaching, but you're actually teaching for free today, and we're all here as your students. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, I think of this as interacting, but um, but thank you. But you see what I'm saying. I, I could still do these. I might write a little bit, although um, anything that I consider taxing, I probably won't do. Things I enjoy, I will. But like we have... You know, you're all familiar with the very sad situation in, in Afghanistan. And our city of St. Louis, to its immense credit, has opened the doors to as many people that want to come here. I mean, you may like or dislike all the politics of it, but I am very proud that the city and county of St. Louis want as many Afghan people that want to relocate somebody to come here. And the group in charge of the process of this is called International Institute. So I'm thinking they could sure use an English teacher, right? They could sure use somebody to drive people around town, right? Um, stuff like that. Um, and and so um, I think that if I had no worries about money, I would probably still find ways to do things that I could sleep good at night about. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I right. think you're like that too, Alex. Now, yeah. at the worst, because I like to garden, so I would not mind going to the local river, the Mississippi or any of the ones that feed into it, and just walking up and down and picking up trash. You know, I, I wouldn't even need to get paid for that. Or going to poor areas of town and helping them grow vegetables, you know. Um, and so I, I, I think that the most optimistic view is machines happily take care of everything. The motivated among us find wonderful things to do. The average people find things now, it won't be easy to find a garbage collector or a, 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 a healthcare nurse. That that's that's something that the robots will do, right? That's, that, that would be the utopian view. And so the things that nobody wants to do, robots do, and the things that humans like to do, and it could be creative. My, my wife likes to uh, knit, make clothes. Well, nobody, with it, well, she's not listening. Hope. She doesn't need to make them. Nobody needs, to, she likes wearing them. People like seeing them when she you know, shows them off, but she doesn't need to. But we could do these things that we enjoy and love doing that are artistic. 
right? And I bet half the people working in academia, if they didn't have to support family and whatnot, would write novels or, you know, um, uh, write poems and things like so that. It may be, I know that Elaine has her hands uh, up there, but before I just uh, hand it to Elaine, it may be that uh, as uh, um, uh, Thomas Malone, the, the, the MIT uh, professor used to, to say, people do things for money, love or glory. Uh, if we don't have to do it for money any longer, uh, we'll do it for love. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lenny, your question. It will be amazing. Uh, I would like to, to, to hear about the difference, the pace uh, and the region uh, of this change, considering developing and develop, developing countries and develop, developed ones. Uh, because sometimes I'm a tradition, because I think we have time to, to see what's going to, to happen in the other countries first, so we can adapt and reflect in advance about our situation. By the other hand, we have the situation that the economic growth of the developing countries, considering the region of the technological development that we have, uh, can break this optimistic chain. <laughs> so I'd like to hear a little, a little bit about that. That's, that's a great question. My first answer is that if I knew the answer to that, I'd, I'd be a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you, you know the concept of leapfrogging. And of course, developing countries, I don't know if we can call Brazil a developing country anymore, but um, uh, maybe it depends on where you are in Brazil. My point just is that um, leapfrogging is a wonderful technique. Uh, Africa, I know, has done a lot of cellular phone work without ever having gone through uh, copper wire. And so keeping an eye open for what works is, is really a great strategy. Now, having the politics and social uh, ability to do that in an organized, widespread manner is is is, is a little bit outside my uh, pay grade, as Obama said. Uh, so being able to do that may be a little tougher. Uh, take blockchain. You know, um, uh, you may be able to wait until the um, kinks are worked out. I think it was El Salvador that adopted Bitcoin as a legal tender. I think it's a pretty weird idea. Uh, we'll see what happens. It's a it's an experiment. Um, I, I think that if you look at the last 50 to 70 years, it may not be obvious, but I think a lot of power in the world has diffused. That clearly we no longer have one superpower in the world. Uh, clearly there are multiple centers of power and influence. You take, and, and I mean including that, not just nations, but the big tech companies. You look at... Um, for example, uh, I don't know about the others, but Microsoft. They have major presence across the globe. They try to skim off not only people that come to the US, but they try to find the best people in, now, I don't know for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me if they had a, a big site in Brazil or Chile. Um, it wouldn't, I know they do in China. I knew they do in, um, um, uh, I don't know if they do Russia, but they do in the Middle East, in Israel and Europe, several places. So without moving anywhere, they have a global presence. So to some extent, tapping into that. Now, they don't necessarily care about the needs of small groups. And being influential in how a Facebook runs and what its rules are. Well, they're not going to be any more concerned generally about people in Bolivia as they are people in North St. Louis, which is our poor area. So finding coalitions, finding alternatives. You know, China has very interesting strategies about cooperating in some ways and co-opting in others. Uh, a little anecdote, I had a friend and I, I lost his friendship. He was actually a senior person, I was a junior person. And he went on a rant about what unethical people the Chinese were. This is 25 years ago. Uh, and intellectual properties I was referring to. And I raised my hand. I said, you know, if it weren't for stealing intellectual property, the United States would not have half of its agriculture. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, who were the founders of the United States, among a group of others, they stole intellectual property from Europe. They stole grape cuttings for the whole wine industry. I don't know what else. Um, now, of course, Benjamin Franklin was an inventor, and, and, and so he invented his own stuff, too. But they had no, they had, they had not the slightest reluctance to steal. So you might not like stealing, but two things. Number one, 
this is not a trait of Chinese people. And it's and it's wrong to say so, in my opinion. And when you are not the one who makes the rules, like the old Americans did not make the intellectual property rules at that time. So they felt themselves somewhat exempt from it. You follow the logic? The Chinese, I think, arguably feel exempt from paying Microsoft a billion dollars a year to use Excel when they have no control. To them, it's a utility, in my opinion. Now, I don't know if that's legally correct or would, would be holed up in the world court, but I'm not unsympathetic to that argument. It may not carry the day, but let's be fair about these arguments, in my opinion. So. I, I think that, let me put it more more uh, locally. Alex and I have talked about there's difficulties for people publishing an IS. Now, this is not quite perhaps as true for people who've gone to smaller schools in the US because at least they have the native language, right? I can't imagine writing in French or speaking enough to get around. So that's a big handicap. Finding a partner from a, a, an English speaking, let's say, for example, that you had ability to gather data and finding someone who helped you write your proposals and polish up and participate in the discussion and have some insight into that would like to collaborate. That's that's a helpful tactic, right? Um, there aren't a lot, like when I go to, when I went to Alex's um, discussion a couple weeks ago, when I go to these international, or, or, confirm, there aren't a lot of gringos there, you know, uh, uh, Amer U.S. citizens. Uh, You're talking about the uh, the one in Chile, right? Yeah, the one in yeah. Chile, the one in South Africa. The, you know, there's usually five Americans, uh, maybe two or three more Canadians. Right? Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't lots of people to contact at various conferences, international conferences, to look for a working relationship with, you know. Uh, my rule uh, for partnerships is I'll work with anybody and take a, not, 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 I can't do this anymore, there's too many people, but when I was open to partnerships, I would do the first step. If they didn't do the second step, it just sits there. No, no harm, no foul. So following through on, on active contribution is a really important thing. Now, I've started writing about an agenda for IT, global IT. Global IS, and, I, and I'm working with Alex and maybe a fellow from Mexico on this. He doesn't know a lot of this yet. Alex doesn't. But I have an invited paper to work on this, which is what I was going to tell him after we were done. And um, so I think that there are a number of papers that come to me from people in what used to be called the third world uh, in uh, uh, Asia and uh, the Middle East not so much South America, that could use a lot of help. Sometimes it's beyond what I can do or what I think our staff can do, our editorials can do. So what differentiates the ones that need a lot of help from that? I get a lot that are 10 years behind what people are talking about in Europe and the States. You see the logic there. Um, so. That doesn't mean everything needs to be cutting edge. There's a, a, a lag time, but you need to understand if something's 10 years behind, what's its value? So for example, let's say that SAP and enterprise systems have been written about for 30 years and a lot is known. And of course it's a German company, so there's some experience with multiple languages. But let's say there are unique characteristics in South America that generate some new ways to do this. Remember I talked about um, uh, uh, there's skills that are universal, skills that are unique to that topic, and skills that are uh, unique to the category. And in the same way, telling the story of what people have learned in Brazil about enterprise systems that understands the general issues that everybody goes through, that shows what's unique to Brazil, and that offers some lessons for people in India, uh, you know, Russia, um, uh, Indonesia. This becomes something that can be very nicely published in an IS journal. 
Now, another thing is, sadly, I think a lot of your schools are trying to pretend that they're top-ranked U.S. schools in terms of their demands on faculty. I think this is stupid, counterproductive, and ridiculous. So when any of you become deans and presidents of schools, um, then be understanding. So a good Brazilian in Portuguese journal can be a great training ground for, first of all, it can be great in and of itself, but it can also provide the experience of going through the process that can be transferred to the the broader uh, the broader um, um, the broader uh, domain or whatever. Um, another thing is that a lot a lot a lot of papers I get are about TAM, and the idea that a seemingly easy and uh, just because it's been published so much, it seems easy. It's almost not publishable anymore. So judging what's risky and what's not, all papers are risky. You'll be turned down more often than accepted, no matter what topic, no matter what you write. My, I, I, probably half of my, first of all, a third of my writings I've never even sent out to anybody. Another third have been rejected at least twice before a third time. Persistence is more important than talent and improvement. Uh, you don't read the first draft of a lot of papers. But I tell you, they're, they're usually pretty bad. But some editor sees a kernel of goodness and works with, with the author. Now, if you published a lot like I have, you avoid some of the obvious errors. But you also, somebody sees your name and they think, you know, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't deny that there is that level of favoritism. The first two thirds of my career, I don't think I profited from that. The second third, I think I have. And I'm shameless about using it. Well, not quite shameless. But within a range, I, I just feel like I, I've earned it. I didn't get invitations to write papers my first 28 years. But now that I have, you know, I actually put more time and energy into those because there's nobody screening them. So I'm more worried about being embarrassed by them than I am about not, not getting published. And I'm going on and on. Did I address a little bit about, about some of the stuff that might be of interest to you? Um, you can always contact an editor directly and say, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? There are a whole range of at least four journals that focus on development issues. One is a world-class journal. It's called the... I can't remember the exact name, the Journal of Development. It's it's edited by a woman in Omaha named, she's a pa Pakistani named uh, Qu Qureshi. Uh, I can't remember her first name. Sajda Qureshi. Information Technology for Development. So you know what I'm talking about. It's got a, uh, a an impact factor equivalent to the basket of eight. Yeah. It's worldwide. It publishes great stuff. Uh, I want it, I'll tell you, if, if this is another project if you're interested. And I actually had this approved by um, Sajda, but I couldn't find somebody to do the work. <laughs> so, and I don't need any credit for this, but I'll, I'll happily act as a consultant if anybody's interested. So there's a journal called Journal of Global Information Management. And it's 10 year anniversary and it's 20 year anniversary. I wrote a paper saying, what have we learned in the last 10 years because of these published papers? I didn't care about how many, I had to put it in the paper anyway for the reviewers, but I didn't care about how many were cases and how many were experiments. I wanted to know what were the results. If 10 papers dealt with e-government internationally, what do we know now as a result of those 10 papers we didn't know before? So I summarized the findings. We didn't know that these are factors that tend to influence. It's obvious to anybody that the governmental regimes will restrict the constraint of, of how people respond. What subset of government is it? If people don't trust their government, they're not going to do it. If you see that a tendency to work together rather than individually makes a difference in how the interface is designed, this is a very valuable question. So these are the kind of things I gathered. And I wrote about a page on 10 different topics within global IT. And then I wrote another page about what we could learn from international business about e-government or about e-commerce, which is really big then, which I think is just dissolved now. 
as a topic. Uh, now it's about recommender systems and stuff in IT, uh, about uh, culture. And so this is a great place to look for topics. But what I offered to do is mentor someone to go through the 60 years of history of the journal we we're just talking about, use some kind of a, you can't go through, you know, 500 journals. I went through uh, 500 journals times uh, 10 articles each or whatever. Um, it's just it's just beyond any individual. A team could do it. Like if you have a doctoral program with eight students and you sign 20 papers to each student, you could do it. But if you had a sample that made sense, just take all the empirical papers, let's say, or pick out four topics that you want to uh, focus on. So if somebody wanted to do this, gather the articles, have a doctoral student, um, you know, make make not a coding like grounded theory, but just extract the findings, what type it is. You could look at my article for a, a sample. Now, the key to that is taking the findings of 10 articles and using the art of reading them and thinking about them and deciding what's important of them and what's missing. I can't do that for you. I mean, I could do it for me. But somebody that is that appreciates the art of IT uh, could, could, could do that. You see what I mean? And, and so that's, that's my, uh, that, that would be a tip that anybody that wanted to, uh, you're welcome to do. And if I were you, if you had an interest, I would email Alex. And if four people said they wanted to do that, he might also, he might email them back and say, there are four people. Let's do it as a team. And you know, the, the, the partnering uh, with people in, in different countries, that's always a great uh, uh, possibility because it brings different perspectives. Uh, first thing, it enriches the paper because it brings different perspectives and usually perspectives that you would never get to uh, if it were not for someone asking something that originally may even sound dumb. And then you suddenly realize, gee, if this guy thinks exactly, you know, in a way that I never thought, that's the richness of it. There's also the, the concept of a genius in his own land or her own land. And I, there is nobody at my school interested in any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I don't even bother anymore giving talks at school. And I mm -hmm. rarely go to them anymore. And uh, so I do think, Alex, that this kind of session presents an opportunity to rethink how our institutions like AIS uh, deal with the whole range of opportunities. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a, a two dozen special interest groups, and they all had programs that were, you know, online and periodic. And there are things you can't do except face to face, mm -hmm. but you emphasize those more. So you don't have boring talks. Yeah. You have workshops. Yeah. You have you have interactions. You have different kinds of activities. It seemed to me that this is an opportunity to redesign. Yeah. The whole. I, way I, I, you know, Fred. I think we're experimenting with this, but I think uh, all these people that are here, uh, and uh, I mean, we we are all convinced that there is uh, something different that we will have to do in the future. When you were talking at the beginning, uh, was uh, 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 was COVID something that we should already have re resilience to, or or whatever? Was it uh, predictable or not, or whatever? I don't know if it was predictable, but it definitely provided us with a chance of experimenting with different things that will have to change the way we teach, the way we research uh, in the future, for sure. And I'm sure that people that are in this group here uh, will be part of uh, this uh, new way of approaching uh, IAS in the future. Okay. We had uh, in CIS uh, last, I guess it was uh, in about February, I published about 45 short articles. Oh, Alex, you were on our yeah. team. Yeah. And uh, on education after COVID. Well, you know, in another year, it might be time to do another one. What are the long-term yeah. experiments that have come out of this? Exactly. What, 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 what after? Okay, because there were things that we were doing simply because we had no alternative. But yeah. what came out of that, and in which ways the the things that we did out of desperate uh, of being desperate, in which ways they now bring us uh, to to a new a completely new environment or, or new new possibilities. And, and in yeah. fact, you know, Marie and well, Elaine is not uh, here with us any longer, but Marie uh, Violeta uh, San, who's there, well. Uh, Pepe, Jose Antonio, and 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 uh, and well, Indira, and all these people. We, we had never in the past. We had never thought of being all together, and now we are doing that every week. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I was going to say also that um, um, not only did it force us to do some new things, but it also showed us some of the things our tools could do that we weren't using. Mm -hmm. For sure. And uh, you know, um, uh, you know, who would have thought to do? You know, I've done about fifteen of these talks in the last 18 months by Zoom. The first ones were, I, I was lined up to go to Israel and give a talk at Tel Aviv University. 
Well, I couldn't travel, so we did it by Zoom. Now I just regularly do two or three of these a month. Yeah. And I, I told somebody at school, and they were like, good grief, you did that? I'm like, well, they never thought of it. And I don't have well, any people. Tell, that tell them it. that in Latin America, we're doing that every week. <laughs> and it's a group of people, a group of researchers from different countries, uh, with students from, from different countries. Yeah, I, I, I think we it, it's time for us to explore new new possibilities. And yeah. besides, not only the meeting, it's also uh, it's, it's recording. So anyone in any place of the world can can watch these videos. Uh, Afterwards. Uh, yeah, exactly. So That's this true. is, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Fred, uh, I'd like to thank you very much. We're sort of, uh, uh, I mean, time goes by, by very quickly. Uh, and uh, you all know, I told you that Fred was a storyteller. Uh, when I gave him an opportunity to talk to me uh, face to face last time, we were talking until midnight, you know, over dinner. But you understand why we enjoy having him around. He has already promised that he will be with us in the research seminars next year, right? Talking about methods to research the future. Start doing your, your homework there, Fred, and start writing the paper uh, because we are anxiously waiting for next year's uh, participation. Well, thank you very much, guys, for being with us. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Alex, I lived in uh, Africa for two years. Right. And um, we used to have something called African time. Well, you know, in Berkeley, they had Berkeley time, right? B Berkeley time was always 10 minutes late, which seemed very Latin American. <laughs> the, the interesting thing in Africa was that you couldn't pick a particular amount of time. People did things when it felt right. Mm -hmm. It's like, Isn't that it's, beautiful? Like, it's like, you know, um, if you're a farmer, you don't plant because it's May 1st or whatever the date. You plant because the soil is ready. Yeah. And you see it in the uh, you see it in the the cues from the environment. Well, but you know, in that uh, Tsuboff, uh, a paper that you just recommended people to to read, she was telling uh, how people were against the idea of having a set time to start working on a factory in the 1800s. So, I mean, we we look at the the way africa is now and we say gee they're they're behind now in fact well hopefully they never got to the slavery scheme that we got into <laughs> yeah it's um well it's it's when you when i grew as i grew up in a very clock oriented time it took a real long time pardon the expression to understand that the the clock is not the only way to see time mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and there's a lot to be said for both both ways, yeah. depending it, on the context. You know, it's difficult for us in our times uh, to think that uh, any society ever lived in a different scheme, in a different situation than these that is ruled by the clock. And we tend to think that they are behind. Uh, but, you know, uh, the more we progress in our direction towards this Hopefully, uh, well, I don't know, uh, of, uh, something that you will tell us about the future of work. <laughs> we, we noticed that the future of work, well, maybe it's going to be leisure, right? Uh, or, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the clock has mastered ruling our lives, for sure. That's what I've been, I've been reading more and more about a, a theoretical or, or a time in the future where there's nothing machines can't do as well or better than humans. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, then what what are the options? And of course, distribution of resources becomes a, a major question. And if that's solved, what what do you do for your self respect? Mm -hmm. Now it yeah. could be that we evolve to where you don't need work, but or you don't need self respect. That seems <laughs> to be the, the case. <laughs> yeah, that could be too. And um, I find I find the thinking about it's interesting because the more I read about this, the fewer new ideas I see. Mm -hmm. But the yeah, more well, arguments and examples that come up. You know, one of the problems that I think we have, maybe in our more technically oriented um, uh, disciplines, is that we tend to look at technology as solving all the problems that we have and also the problems that we don't have. Uh, but we never look at technology as being the cause of the problems or, or many of the problems that we have. Uh, I wonder if the, the, 
I think I, I, I wonder if the Benedictine uh, monks of the 1300s or so, when they invented the clock, if they knew where the clock would lead us to, if they would still be considering that a clever invention. <laughs> That's a good, you know, they may be roasting in hell right now. Uh, <laughs> well, I, what, um, what I would say is that they made much more for capitalism than for religion. <laughs> Although, you know, a lot of religious orders are very much run by the clock. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Zen Buddhism in, in Japan, you know, they have eight minutes to meditate and then they have 12 minutes to prepare dinner. And it's it's very, very yeah. regulated. It was very strict, yeah. Well, that was actually the fact with the Benetine uh, monks. They they had to do their prayers, I think, seven times a day. Uh, and they, they should be at the same, uh, same, same distance in, in time. Uh, yeah. And of course, they could do that very rigorously during the day with their sun uh, sundials when when it was not raining. Uh, but it was almost it was definitely impossible to do it in a precise way in the during the night. So they invented the clock to make sure that they would be praying at the right time, right? Yeah. But the thing is, uh, this technology that had that purpose has been used to you know to to cause many other different uh, behaviors in humans. Uh, that probably God would not be very happy about. So I think it's really interesting how our technology um, affects so much in our lives. Uh, when I lived in Africa, as I was mentioning, uh, there was almost no, there were very little electricity and almost nobody had lights. Mm -hmm. So um, I would have lights on my porch. I would turn on and every night students would come and study on my porch. But when I turned them out, it was complete dark. In, in our whole Cartier, our whole neighborhood. And and so the the pace of life was very different. And you know, in the old days, uh, people where I, I lived in West Africa would spend the evening at a campfire mm -hmm. and they would tell stories. They couldn't read even if they had books because there was no light. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it we're constrained by our devices in terms of what we can do, you know? And- But at uh, the same time, your mind was free to exercise itself and yeah. do different things that we are, we are now uh, uh, sort of limited because, you know, what, what can we do when we have lights? Uh, watch Netflix, maybe. Uh, yeah. God. And and what's interesting is it's like um, people, even to when I lived there in the 1980s, could memorize whole books and long stories like uh, Homer's Odyssey. They would just be able to tell this in little chunks night after night. Now, it's usually in their language, and then every once in a while they point at me and I'll laugh. But other than that, it was all just very normal, you know. And I, I didn't understand a word, but I loved listening. Um, and I was just there. First part oh, of it maybe was, they were telling you that they knew it all by heart, and maybe you believed it, and they were just repeating yeah, the same sentence, a long sentence over and over. <laughs> could be, could be. And uh, but it was it was um, it was quite an experience. Yeah, and, it's it, it's interesting uh, the way that. Uh, technology intrudes into our lives in a way that it actually shapes the way that we are going to behave and actually even, I believe, what we're going to be uh, yep. based on, on its introduction, right? Well, it's also really interesting how inventors of these technologies tend to be very optimistic. Mm -hmm. And then people find all sorts of either trivial or, or negative ways to use things. So when they invented television, people thought it would be this tremendous educational device. And others thought, well, nobody will watch it because you know, when you're listening to the radio, you can do other things. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's technology is is very un. There's a lot of uh, what's a good way to put it. Um, slack from when something's invented to the full range of how it can be used takes yeah. shape. You know. Well, we can always think of the the users as the developers of their own technology in use, as some some others claim, and 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 I believe that happens. It's just that many times the technology in use uh, seems much less noble than maybe what the designers originally thought of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a uh, it's you know it's it, it, which raises the interesting question: when something like artificial intelligence is used for evil or for or does harm to people, how much is the original engineer responsible for that? Sometimes, you know, being a little critical, I think that, that that could be the way we are going with the with, with the possibilities of work in the future for humans, all right? At least for, for the ones among us here who are still human, right? I, I don't think that we have any robots around. At least the faces that I see seem to be 
still recognizable as human. Yeah, sometimes I wonder about myself. I, I actually think it's less likely we'll be replaced by robots than by what are called cyborgs. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but you know, as they replace body parts, uh, you become more and more of a machine. Now I've only had two. One is uh, some uh, fillings in my teeth, and the other is what's called a stent in my heart. Uh, I had heart surgery, and they put in what's called a stent. So part of my your glasses? heart is, would your glasses still be considered? Would still be considered no, your glasses? That, that would be a prosthetic. That's outside okay. of you. All right. Although a prosthetic, like a, a, an arm, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess would be marginal. But and and what happens, uh, Fred, when, when uh, for example, last uh, or uh, about three weeks ago, I had an eye surgery. So they actually took part of my eye out, and I see much better now, except that some, for, for reading, I need this stupid thing still. Uh, but uh, then am I a cyborg or not in that well, case? Well, you see, it's not a yes or no. It's from zero to 100%. Right. So my guess is that as we develop more and more substitutes for body parts, that actually perform better than the original. I, I understand some athletes have had their legs cut off on purpose so they could get artificial limbs in order to perform better in their sport. Now, I don't know if this is like a joke or false news, and it seems early in the day for this, but I could see where an increasing number of devices could actually be improvements to the point where we are less and less arguably biologically human and yet retain, you know, it's like our blood is, is uh, we have 100% new blood, I don't know, every six months or something. But as far as we know, we're still the same person, right? I mean, not a single one of my cells existed when I was 13 that exists now, but yet I still think of myself as the same person. Thank, uh, thank you, Fred, for, for being uh, And uh, I, I believe we met in, uh, in Mexico, in Puebla, in 20... Oh, that, that could well be. With, with Guillermo, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I was there, I gave a talk on the future of work there too. You might have right, recognized right. the same overheads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. It was good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. It's my, my privilege. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you very much. All right.